Okay. Okay. Yeah. Looks like the movements are all good. It's not just a kind of thing. Okay. I don't need them to this one to come. Is that mine? Did everybody get a copy of the handout? Also, a stack here on the bibliography. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are okay. Evidently, the copy will be done in about ten minutes. I won't be. I'm right at this point. We're behind schedule, so I got to get going. Okay, so uh, spiritual formation part two, also known as the uh, spiritual disciplines. Where we left off last week is discussing this notion of how, how do we go about actually achieving spiritual formation? And I hate to even use the word achieve because it implies that we're really doing something, but we're, we're not doing much, okay? And we use the term indirection or obliquity. These things are accomplished in our lives in an indirect manner. And this is the best example of that. The Panama Canal, if you're going to go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, you don't go west. You go from northwest to southeast. You enter the Pacific 30 miles east where you left the Atlantic. And um, so we use the term obliquity. Indirectness is, is another word. And in fact, this week, how many of you subscribe to, uh, to Richard Rohr's devotional emails? Did you see it on Monday? <laughs> when he said, as long as we are in control, we're going to keep trying to steer the ship by our previous experience of being in charge. The only way we will let ourselves be ambushed is by trusting the ambusher and learning to trust that the darkness of intimacy will lead to depth, safety, freedom, and love. So God has to come indirectly, catching us off guard, off guard and out of control when we are empty instead of full of ourselves. So I thought, well, if, if, if uh, anyone can confirm what I'm uh, talking about is Richard Rohr, and there he did. So, good job, Bill. Okay. Practicing the spiritual disciplines does not earn the Holy Spirit's engagement. The way forward uh, 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 in spiritual formation is on the path of spiritual disciplines. And we do exercise effort. But our effort doesn't earn the Holy Spirit's engagement. Our effort simply puts us into a place, if you will, where the Holy Spirit has access to us to do as he or she feels fit to do. So that's that's all about uh, just making yourself available to God. So we want to talk about the spiritual disciplines. Richard Foster wrote this book, A Celebration of Discipline. Gosh, he must have written it in the late 70s or early 80s. And uh, uh, we've told you a lot about the church we were in. And I was often in trouble in that church, 
often under um, uh, discipline, if you will, church discipline. So when my friend Keith said, oh, you got to read this book, Celebration of Discipline, I was like, no effing way am I going to read that book because I don't like discipline. I don't like being in trouble. And I'm certainly not going to celebrate it. So I just kind of put that to the side and I never read it. I have two copies of it and I have never read it. However, this book, Spiritual Disciplines Handbook, I came on this much, much later. Looks like this. Um, and she, so uh, uh, Foster identifies 12 different spiritual disciplines. Um, Adele Calhoun identifies 60, 63. And then there are other books that describe even more. So there's lots of guidance out there on the notion of how do you follow spiritual disciplines? Um, I, I do think uh, from what I have read of Foster that Calhoun's book is um, more accessible, let's say it that way. Okay. So the first discipline we want to talk about is silence. Thomas Keating, the monk who popularized centering prayer, famously said, silence is the first language of God. And then, of course, there's Mother Teresa and her famous, at least to me, wonderful description of prayer. And she said, prayer is simply listening to God and listening to the silence. For some of us, this discipline is the hardest of the disciplines to participate in. <laughs> My number one strength in the strength finders profiles is input. I love input. However, that input comes to me. Books, audiobooks, music, TV drives my wife crazy because I'll sit with the TV on and music playing in my Bluetooth hearing aids while I'm reading the book. Drives her crazy. Um, we're so used to this cultural addiction to uh, amusement. And remember, what did uh, uh, Postman, Neil Postman, say about amusement? If you break it down, it's amusement. And in Latin, it's not thinking. We entertain ourselves so we don't have to think and pay attention to life. So we tend to be uncomfortable with the silence. We have a habit of, of um, glancing at words and looking for the bullet and for the bold print and we skim and we, we ask for summaries and we want speed because we don't want to wait. And waiting in silence is the worst, also the best. Why do we do it? It's the Holy Spirit's job to keep the inner process of revelation underway. But in order for the Spirit to do her job, we need to cooperate and put ourselves into a place to deeply and reflectively listen. So we offer, uh, we, we just want to be alone with God in the silence, and we offer our body and our attention to God as a prayer. So just some practical things. How do you do this? Find a quiet, comfortable spot. Preferably not in front of the TV. A quiet, comfortable spot. Set a timer. Usually your, your phone will do it. Are, are you asking a question or is that just resting no, your hand? So okay. <laughs> um, set a timer. I was doing this the other day and I was sitting in silence and trying to trying to concentrate on being in God's presence. And the, the thought that kept coming was, I forgot to set the timer. I'm going to die right here waiting for that timer to ding. And I picked it up, and I was like 30 seconds from the end of the, of the cycle. The first, time, the first time I sat in silence, the guy who, who taught me these things said, um, don't, don't go along. Just set your timer for a couple minutes, maybe five minutes. And I remember thinking, well, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time. I can sit in silence. 
So I set the timer for 15 minutes. <laughs> the longest damn 15 minutes of my life. And um, at the end, I kid you not, at the end, because it was this sense of, I'm just sitting here in God's presence, sitting at the feet of God, not demanding, not asking, just sitting here in God's presence. And I think after about 10 minutes, I felt God moving on me, but without words. Just this sense of acceptance and love, unconditional love. And at the end, when the timer went, I just broke out in tears and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed because it was just something I'd never done before. And God met me in that, which was a wonderful thing. But I, so I, but I do not recommend starting this with 15 or 20 minutes. You, you just can't do it. Start with five. It's good. Then listen and pay attention. Um, um, you'll be surprised when you're trying to be silent how many things you hear. This morning, there was a woodpecker on the stove pipe. Uh, just let it go. Our monkey brain will raise so many thoughts to interfere. And as they come, just gently let them go. Not gonna talk, I'm not going to think about that. Just let it go. Sometimes having a pad of paper handy will help because something will come up and you'll think, oh man, if I don't write this down, I'm going to forget it. And so just write it down and then let it go. Get back to your, <coughs> your silence. Um, just be with God. There's a wonderful story that Larry Crabb tells about Brennan Manning. Are you familiar with either of those names? Larry Crabb, famous uh, evangelical counselor, uh, written a lot of books about counseling, psychological care, uh, marriage, all those kinds of things. He was speaking at a conference with Brennan Manning. Have you heard of Brennan Manning? Okay, Brennan Manning is a defrocked Catholic priest. He died just a few years ago, I think 2016. Um, but Brennan Manning's whole ministry was about grace, finding grace, reveling in grace, living in grace. Um, he was a struggling alcoholic, and he would actually go sometimes. Well, I won't get into that. But anyway, uh, he and Larry Crabb both spoke at the same conference for pastors. And uh, Larry describes it as they're in the, the ninth floor balcony of their hotel. Everything was wrapped up and they're getting ready to go on to their next things. And Larry Crabb asked Brennan Manning, well, Brennan, where are you off to next? And Brennan said, well, tomorrow morning I start a seven-day silent retreat. <coughs> and Larry Crabb, being the good evangelical, said, Brennan, I know you do this a lot, but... Do you get anything out of that? And Brennan said, I've never thought of it. No, I don't think I do. And Crabb asked him, well, then why do you do it? And he said, oh, because God likes it when I show up. God likes it when you show up. He's particularly fond of you. And he likes it when you show up. The benefits of silence are often seen in the fruit it bears rather than the actual experience of silence per se. So, next, slowing. I really debated including this practice because many of us are retired and don't have the pressures of a day to day, work a day world. We've already significantly slowed down. But I also realized that many of us have filled our days and we're nearly as busy now as we were before we retired. We're just doing different stuff. And we can get so busy um, doing these kind of urgent things and preoccupied with whatever is next that we fail to experience the present moment. And we have no idea what, if anything, God is trying to do in our present moment. But here's the thing, 
We don't get to our future any faster if we hurry. You don't get there any faster if you hurry. And we certainly don't become better people in haste. More likely than not, the faster we go, the less we become. Slowing down intentionally develops a margin in our lives. And it doesn't happen automatically. Um, we have to incorporate practices that will do that for us. Here's the interesting thing. Our past is behind us. You can't go there. Our future is ahead of us. You can't go there yet. What you have is this single present moment where those two things touch. And they touch for just a moment and then and it's on to the next moment. So by slowing down, we become um, uh, tuned into the present moment. So how do we do that? Um, drive in the slow lane. Now, um, I will say this. Uh, you still need to go speed limit because you're causing a lot of people behind you to lose their sanctification if you're driving too slow <laughs> in, in that lane. Um, park far away from the grocery store and saunter in. And then after you've done your shopping, pick the longest line. And somewhere in that process, let somebody go ahead of you. Because you're not in a hurry. Eat slowly. This is hard for me. I like to eat. I tend to eat fast. Um, don't set a morning alarm. How many of you do set a morning alarm? Two, three people. Three people. Yeah, I, I wake up at the same time whether whether I use an alarm or not. So I just don't set an alarm. Only when I have to be somewhere early do I set an alarm. And then plan buffers between meetings and events. Just give yourself some time in the calendar between those things. Next, journaling. Is, is Audrey in? Yes. Okay. Journaling is a way of paying attention to our lives. It's a way of processing the emotions in our heart. And it's a place to sound off to God so we don't sound off in inappropriate ways to others. <laughs> Um, I was taught early in my Christian life. Yes, ma'am. The coffee's done. How many people want coffee? One, two, <laughs> sixty. Sorry. It's better to tell God how you feel sometimes than necessarily to tell other people how you feel. And well, uh, next point then, why do we do it? Um, lost her. Can you advance me? I think so. It's next. Just hit the next slide. Just hit the enter. Yeah. Back up. Okay. Here, why? Because sometimes we don't know what's inside of us until it comes outside of us. And then we see it with a little bit more objectivity. And it's the ongoing nature of it that matters. Now we can go to many. So, uh, when you're a bear of very little brain and you think of things, you find sometimes that a thing which seems very thingish inside of you is quite different when it gets out into the open. <laughs> Next. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to draw. Whatever works for you. You can do it on a computer. You can do it in a journal. I have 20, 21 or 22 moleskins, each one a year. 
or a, usually about nine months old. And then I have a bunch of other types and styles of journals because I've been doing this for all the way to the very 42 plus years. I've been doing this for nearly 50 years. I still got them all. And the instructions to my son are when I die, burn them down. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, periodic, it doesn't have to be every day, it doesn't have to be every week. It's just, you're just finding the rhythm of journaling that suits your phase and stage of life, whatever works for you. It might be once a month. It might be twice a month. It might be three or four times a day. All depends on you and what you need and how you're moving with God. And then in that journal, you want to tell the truth to God and to yourself as best you can. Now, there are times when you don't want anyone to see a record of what you've said. But you still need to say it. And when I have that kind of experience going on, I simply write the first letter of every word in the sentence I'm praying or saying. Now, interestingly enough, if I do dialogue journaling and I write down what God is saying back to me, he never replies in my code. He just says it. <laughs> so if I bring something up in confidence in my code, he goes, yeah, whatever. And he just says it out loud back to me. And so it's, it's kind of pointless sometimes to, if you're doing dialogue journey. But anyway, um, he, he does not seem to always be bound by our rules. Um, so, <coughs> tips uh, on how to do this. Always put um, at the top of the page, the day, the date, the time, and where you were when you wrote it. Because then when you go back to review, boom, it all comes back. Oh yeah, Sunday, March 7th, 2010, 7.20 uh, a.m. in our living room. And, and then it, it all comes back. Um, don't include just things you journal. This was from an experience with, with uh, Deb and our two daughters when we went to Bloedel. And I found this clover that I just thought, it, it wasn't even a four-leaf clover, it was just a nice, nice clover. I picked it and stuck it in the journal and kept it. And I know exactly where I was and the date when that happened. Um, often you can cut things out um, that you've printed or came out of a, a, a book or something like that, just photocopy, tape those in there too, and then they're always there for you when you come back to them. <laughs> Monday, August 24th, 2009, 1.15 a.m., living room. So the first day of the new full semester, and I cannot sleep. I had no caffeine, just nerves. Every dream as I fade to sleep is about the first class or about not being ready for the first class. Phantom pains and gorilla itches flitter across my body, erupting in strange places. I don't really have anything to be nervous for, and I have everything to be nervous for. The new program's success or failure will rest with me. I'm now the responsible one before it was my chair or the other coordinator. Um, and then I went on to describe some things and I talked with Deb and she said, you can't share that, so. Um, <laughs> um, I do go back and refer to them. And sometimes what's amazing to me is uh, something from 20 or 30 years ago, I will read it and say, man, have I changed at all? That same issue is still there. Oh God. Please come to my assistance. Oh God, make haste to help. And then other times I read things that I wrote 20 or 30 years ago and I thought, wow, that's gone. Why was, why was that ever an issue? Poof. So, how, how often do you go back and read things? Um, two or three times a year, probably. Yeah. Especially if I'm looking for something that I remember that I wrote down. Uh -huh. And then I have to find the right journal. 
2011, 2012 were especially intense years because we were wrapping up, leaving one church, wrapping up, leaving one job, moving to another state to take another job. It was very intense. So I was writing like every day. The other thing was um, this becomes, uh, for me, it was everywhere all the time. So I would go to church, I would take message notes. And, um, and if it was an especially boring message, I would draw house plants. <laughs> and you will find uh, all, you know, through different locations, different things where you realize, oh, that was a boring message because that was all of the house plants. <laughs> anyway. Um, there's something I was going to share from this one. I don't remember. Um, Okay. Um, communicate to others in your household that it's your turn. It's not their turn. It's not theirs to read. We've been married 43 years. I've never looked at one of her journals because I don't want her to look at mine. Have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, and we taught our kids that too. Yeah. Yeah, we taught them to journal and we taught them not to read other people's journals. Okay, devotional reading, AKA Lexio Divina. Now, we all know how to make a snowball, right? And we know the feel of the snowball and we can see the snowflakes on our, on our, our, uh, our clothes. That is direct sensei experience. And, uh, and experiential. And this is what, um, this sort of knowing that's direct, sensate, and experiential um, is, a, is a sort of knowing that transcends the intellect. In this case, it is aimed at furthering relationship with God. So this uh, practice of Lectio Divina is actually rooted in church history because for most of the, of the or first, at least the first five or 600 years of church history, maybe the first thousand or 1500 years of church history, most people couldn't read. And even if they could read, they didn't have a Bible. So scriptures were read as part of the service, just like we do here. We have the readings and we read them out loud. Often the way they practiced it in the past was they would read it once, pause, and then read it again, pause, and then read it a third time. You think our services are long. <laughs> um, but the point in that is as you listen to it being read out loud, you are uh, listening for God, for the Holy Spirit to put their uh, divine finger on a word or a phrase. So you're listening for that. And um, it's not an exercise in mentally critiquing or, or exegesis, but for furthering divine companionship. God invites us into his presence to listen for a particular loving word in that particular context. There are basically five steps in this as it's traditionally been done. The first is silencio, you're, you're quiet, preparing the heart, you slow down, you relax, and you're intentionally releasing the chaos and noise in your mind to God. Lexio then is you read that passage or verse slowly out loud. Because out loud processes differently than silently with just your eyes. When a word catches your attention, don't keep reading. Just stop and attend to what God is saying. Listen, be open, don't judge, don't analyze, just listen and wait. Then Meditatio, read the passage a second time out loud and savor the words. Listen for any invitation that God is extending to you and gently explore the ramification of God's invitation. What would it mean if? And then Oratio, respond in prayer. Read the scripture passage again for the third time. Talk to God about it. There's, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Respond truthfully and authentically. What feelings has that text aroused in you? 
and tell God, I don't like what you just said. Or I don't understand what you just said. And then see what he says back. So, yeah, yes. In, in studying scripture, that's one of my difficulties in working with scriptures. I, is, is each particular word there that God put so that you would get something out of it? Or is it the total focus of what's being said? Because, uh, because yeah, I really have hard time with the person. The, the hard time, the notion of taking it apart, you know, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, word by word. I understand the heartburn of that because it feels like we're wrenching something out of the context and surrounding. But this isn't about exegesis or or uh, mm -hmm. hermeneutic tool or anything like that. This is about the Holy Spirit saying. Pay attention to this. And interestingly enough, very often it's that word, the Holy Spirit takes it out of context and says, it's really about this area of your life, which has nothing to do with the wholeness of the passage, but just that word that the Holy Spirit wants to minister. The last uh, step is um, contemplation. Contemplate, rest, and wait in the presence of God. Allow some more time for that word to sink deeply into your soul as you deal. Um, and then before you leave, you might jot it down. What, is, what did the Holy Spirit say and why? You cannot be in a hurry doing this process. You just can't. So you need to give yourself some time for it. Um, it's like this. The ancient discipline, monastic discipline of absorbing scripture by osmosis. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the number of times I, I fall asleep reading the Bible, hoping that something will get through. Okay, so um, devotional reading is, is uh, um, usually done with scripture, but other devotional writers can be useful for this practice. Thomas Merton. Is that right, Thomas Merton? Yeah. yeah. Richard Rohr. Um, Richard Foster. C.S. Lewis, Philip Yancey, Mary Oliver, Henry Nowen. Whatever you happen to be reading, you can do the same process because the Holy Spirit's there. God comes to you disguised as your wife. So if you're reading prayers by Mary Oliver or John O'Donohue and you start to practice Lectio Divina, the Holy Spirit will respond and come to you. Um, you can also try a variation called Visio Divina, which is the contemplation of art in the same way. So if you take a painting like this and you just, you just study it and then study it and study it for what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Is it, oh God, it's a painting? Or is it, oh God, it's God? What's happening here? Deb said when she looks at this, she, Mary's thinking, I just had a baby. Now we have house guests. We can get This is a sculpture in the uh, Bishop's Garden at the Washington Cathedral, National, or in Washington, D.C., the National Cathedral. It's um, uh, designed by Heinrich Warnke. And it's the return of the prodigal. So here's the father leaning over, wrapping up his son, the son clutching at his uh, waist on his knees. I, I sat in this garden, stared at this sculpture for the longest time because it meant so much to me of the looking at the father's embrace. So, Visio Divina, you can give that one a try. There's a book about Visio Divina on the list on the, on the, uh, on the bibliotic. It's down under specific. specific practices. If you're interested. Okay. Breath prayer. Breath prayer is a way of praying with your whole body, not just your mind. You're engaging that autonomic 
breathing system. And it's a way of making prayer autonomous. So the, traditionally, the, the breath prayer has been on the inhale, you say, Lord Jesus Christ, or Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, on the inhale, and on the exhale, have mercy on me, sin. And it can also just be have mercy. So um, I want you, everybody take a deep breath in. And out. Okay, in your head, as you're breathing in, in your head, say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. And on the exhale, say, have mercy on me, sin. And you just repeat this. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, this is how they say, when, when Paul says, let prayers be continually made, this is what he's talking about, breath prayer, until it becomes part of you. And on the inhale and the exhale, you're praying. And it doesn't have to be this phrase. You can say, Abba, on the inhale, on the exhale. or Lord, here I am, or Holy Spirit, speak to me, or anything you want to make up that works for you. Um, almost every religion in the world uses prayer beads. Buddhists, Hindus, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, almost Every religion uses prayer beads. Now, this is an Anglican prayer bead. Praise God. Um, it is so much shorter than the Catholic rosary. That's all I have. Um, and there's a, a variety of different prayers you can pray. You usually do the Lord's Prayer here, and then the initiatory bead, and then you just work your way around. And the reason beads are useful in prayer is because having something tactile that you can touch as you're praying actually takes the pressure off the rest of your senses. And you can just touch them, feel them as you pray. And it actually helps you concentrate. You would think, oh, that's a distraction. It's really not. It helps you concentrate. Don't like one this big. There's little ones you can get that just go on a finger and they have little beads. My good friend Carlos, the Catholic, uh, I asked him if he used beads. He goes, Oh, yeah, all the time. And I said, how did, how did you learn it growing up? He goes, Well, we always started with big bead, little bead, little bead, little bead, little bead. Little bead. <laughs> so using prayer beads can sometimes help fixed hour prayer fixed hour prayers is a continuation of the Jewish uh, practice of going to the temple every three hours to pray and in fact in Acts it talks about um, uh, uh, Peter, James and John going up to the temple at the third hour to pray. So um, it's a continuation of the Jewish practice that early church picked it up and never dropped it. Um, it's also strongly embedded in the Benedictine monastic tradition, which was the first 500 years of the church. And the prayers that are offered at fixed hours can be spontaneous or liturgical. So what are those fixed hours? And I'm sorry, I do not do it this way. <laughs> um, vigils is night prayer, usually about 4 o'clock in the morning. Lots is at 3 a.m. Prime, 6 a.m. Terps, 9 a.m. Sext at noon, non at 3 p.m. Vestris at 6 p.m. Compline before bedtime, and Matins at midnight. This is if you are really dedicated to the <laughs> And you did not. And you don't need to sleep. Um, the non-monastic fixed hour prayer, this is the way I think of it, is 
The morning office is simply sometime between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. Sometime in those three hours, I could get there and I could go. Uh, midday, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, I don't always do midday prayers. Uh, Vespers, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. That's in the middle of making and eating dinner and doing homework with the kids and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I don't know that I've ever prayed Vespers. Sorry. Compline is simply to be observed before retiring. I love Compline. And in fact, we were just at St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral in, um, in Seattle. Every Sunday night, they do a podcast of the Compline. And it's wonderful. Uh, you should, I mean, I, it's a profound spiritual experience. And then the office of the night, watch 1.30 uh, a.m. to 4.30 a.m. You know that uh, St. Mark's Complex is uh, broadcast on uh, uh, King FM. Oh, is it? Yeah. I listen to that in my truck yeah. sometimes. Okay. The radio station. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, sources for these prayers. Uh, there's a three volume set called The Divine Hours by Phyllis Tickle. She's broken them up into spring, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, the Common Prayer by uh, Shane Claiborne, uh, which is it's called a uh, liturgical prayer for ordinary radicals. And then Celtic Daily Prayer by the Northumbrian community. So these are the three volumes of Phyllis Tickle's The Divine Hours. And then this is the Common Prayer, the Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals, and then self, uh, Celtic Prayer. Um, Deb has used this and the next volume after that. Um, I couldn't make sense of it initially, so I let her use it, and she loved it. Um, I tend to use this one the most. General tips on, um, oh, okay, so that wraps it up oh. on the six disciplines. Now, some general tips. Don't be in a hurry. God is never in a hurry. So you can't be in a hurry when you're doing spiritual disciplines. Number two, have a place, if you can, even if it's just a chair in the corner that you return to for those disciplines. Um, this is the entrance hall of our old house in Utah. And if you look over here to the right, this was a, a bedroom that we converted to a chapel. And it had one chair. It had an old Catholic kneeler that we got at, a, at an antique store. It had this little altar that looked like that. And um, we, we, we used this all the time. And, but when we moved into a smaller house in Manchester, there, our, our chapel, if you will, was a walk-in closet off my office. It was very crowded. And then the new house here in Big Harbor, we don't have enough room. So, that's my little altar in the corner of my office. And every time I spin my chair around, I'm, I'm bumping the table behind me, my feet are in the altar. It's very cozy, but it still works. Um, light a candle, just like we do here. A candle is a symbol of the spirit of God and his presence in whatever you're doing. And then uh, ring a bell just like we do here. And then uh, palms down, palms up. Have you ever done that, that prayer? You take five deep breaths um, in your nose, out your mouth, with your hands down, with the intent that you're letting all the crap of the day drain out of your hands. And then after you do those five breaths, you turn them over and you do the same five breaths again to receive whatever the Holy Spirit is offering to you. Um, so light a candle, ring a bell. Um, because we used to have everything in one location, now our, our, our two personal chapels are split. Debbie got my bell home. <laughs> I got this little school bell thing. Uh, and then the hands down, hands up. Okay, so just to wrap this up then. 
Spiritual formation is the Holy Spirit's process of transforming us into the image of Christ for the sake of others. Deb's got just a few comments to add. It's actually a story. Story. Um, so you can meet my camera. December 2016, my father passed away. Three weeks later, we found out that um, our kids were pregnant with their second son, but then he had a heart problem. And at first they said, well, and they found it on first ultrasound, so this was gonna, this was, this was good. And they said, well, he'll probably need the three valve, the three surgeries that fix a valve problem. Okay, that was hard for me to stretch my mother out. Then they called back from a month later and said, um, the valve surgeries aren't gonna work. The whole right side of his heart doesn't work. He's gonna need a heart transplant. This was way more than I had ever had to handle before. So we had already started to move into some of these practices, and I was absolutely at a loss as to how to pray. And all I could do was go into that chapel and just hold, I mean, literally, it was like just holding, they'd already named him, Malcolm. He could die any day in the womb, or he would die in labor and delivery if he made it that far. And he would need an organ transplant eventually if he lived that long. Uh, there are very few infant donors for hearts. So one of my daughters had been to the Iona community in Ireland, and she brought back this candle holder for me of the Trinity. And it's part of the Celtic prayer process. And, and so I um, would use that when I was praying. And one day, so in centering prayer, you're supposed to just stop and, and look inward and you're not supposed to talk <laughs> or open your eyes but I opened my eyes anyway and I thought this is the prayer that God gave me or the and it, it just went like this held held by the trinity the three in one lit from within holy holding me holding me in silence not expecting anything held by the three in one. And that became my my mantra really for, for a long time. And even now, if I get overwhelmed and have a lot of anxiety, I go back to these prayers. It gave me the ability to just hold all the uncertainty of waiting to see what was going to happen with Malcolm. Malcolm was had a healthy delivery without having a conception. Malcolm survived long enough to get a heart, survived long enough to get a pacesetter. Um, is that the right word? Pacemaker, thank you. That um, would control his heartbeat better. That was wearing out, this is a hard time. And he turned six in May. There's still some developmental issues that you should catch up on those. And so far, so good. But in that time, in that moment, if, if I hadn't been taking a more contemplative place, because I've learned I don't know what God's will has been in the situation for them. And you have to face that reality that he might not make it. But there's also the hope that he could. And that you're with that. So this short little, I call it a prayer. Um, is what carried me through that. And I shared it with our family. And it, um, the one thing someone I did not expect, we were living in Utah, was when he was born, we were actually, well, when he got the heart, we were, you know, when he got the heart, we were actually in Washington, two hours away from leaving to go back to Utah. And we got him off of the transplant team. So everything kind of came together that weekend. And our whole family, which we're all dealing with all of this in very, very different ways, um, just came together. And my daughter-in-law, Malcolm's mom, said, this is just an amazing circle of grace this weekend. And it really was. I don't, you know, none of us know the future.
future. But I, six years earlier, I would never have been in a place to receive that kind of ministry from the Holy Spirit. So hang in there. My my number one tip is find what works for you yeah. and be open to it because things that may be absolutely amazing for someone else may not be your thing, but be open and curious to see where God's going to touch you. Okay. Do you have any questions? The, uh, the handout, um, this one has um, Calhoun's a table that goes with, with each of the uh, particular uh, practices. She also has a, a two-page written text that describes the issues as well. And then this one is simply a bibliography of books that we have found useful over the last 10, 12 years on disciplines and spiritual practices. Okay. And I just have a comment that yeah. anybody that wants to learn to meditate, I use my meditation, I've been doing it for years on uh, essence space, and you do pay for that, but you can get it for day three. It does exactly what you said, you start with three. I'm a, I can do a half hour now. You know, and it starts so, with the breathing. Meditating in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but he talks through the half hour, and oh. different times he'll tell yeah. you different things to do. So your assignment, he's not always that. But the breathing thing, I've never, he does that breathing, that's how you start. But I'm going to change it now. That, but I always do pray through it as well. So I'm not completely silent. It's all listening and responding. And this is an app? It's an app called um, Headspace. Headspace. And you can get it on radio too, which is a daily thing. He does all kinds of talks about that. But he was along and okay. he left the monastery. And he shares a lot of yeah. that. And then the other thing, the, the picture that you have of the person with the hands are on the plane flat, the up here, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is so much what happens. I took a pottery class, and the first thought you make, the person holds your hands to oh. show you how to do it. And the fact that the it's the pot on the plane, the God thing, yeah. the last picture is uh, any other questions or comments? Next forum is Carol. Oh, <laughs> right. We're going to be talking about um, viewing the whole week as, as one. I mean, I think a lot of us grew up with every day of a holy week with a separate service. We're going to talk about how we together and look at things. The word paradox is throughout holy. Um, we see contrast and, and so we're going to just try to refresh ourselves and get ready for holy, which begins what? Third? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Thank you very much for coming. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.